purple haze all in my brain. Lately things, they don't seem the same. Acting funny, and I don't know why. Excuse me while I kiss the sky. Hey, welcome to our second topic episode. The quote there was from Purple Haze by Jimi Hendrix, as I'm sure you probably already knew. Originally, this episode was going to be in collaboration with one of my friends over on YouTube about the impact music can have on mental health. Due to a few delays, the collaboration is going to be released at some point in the coming months instead. We've already seen how mental health has impacted the music we love in some of our previous episodes. The music of both David Bowie and Fleetwood Mac were influenced by schizophrenia, as we've already discussed. So I thought that the best way to show how many of the musicians we love have had dealings with mental health was to take a closer look at one of the 20th century's most acclaimed circle of artists, the 27 Club. The club is infamous, but for those of you who aren't aware of it, I'll break it down. The 27 Club consists of musicians who unleash their creativity upon the world right from the 1930s up to the present day. Every member of this group died at the age of 27. Some of the most influential artists of modern times have been sadly ordained into this group. Many of them suffered with mental health issues. Before we really get into this, I want to clarify that I by no means have any qualifications in psychology. Any of the issues discussed here come with my own research from various databases on mental health, which are by no means an adequate substitute for psychology. Some of the articles discussed do come from qualified sources and I'll make sure to signpost these. The purpose of this episode is to create a dialogue on mental health via some of the world's most revered musicians and a critique of the potentially falsely glorifying 27 Club. If you disagree with any of what is discussed here, as ever feel free to email us. Our details will be in the credits at the end of the episode. With that out of the way, let's continue. The first member of the club was Robert Johnson. I know it might feel like I say this a lot by this point, but Johnson was one of the single most important musical figures of the 20th century. His recordings number less than 50, but each of them is the template for the blues guitarists that rocked the 1960s scene. Don't just take it from me, but from the guitarists themselves. Eric Clapton described Johnson as, quote, the most important blues singer that ever lived. Keith Richards said that it was as good as the blues got, no matter how hard he might have tried. Both Clapton's Cream and Richard Stone's made attempts to emulate and build off of his work, covering three of his tracks between them. In the circles of the musical incline, this man needs no introduction. As a bedrock of the blues, he is a bedrock of every offshoot of rock and roll, which just about covers the majority of popular Western music. The Johnson recordings themselves were made throughout the singer's intermittent career over the 1930s. With sources being few and far between for Johnson's life, it's really hard to kind of get a grasp on his mental health. There's also the fact that diagnosis and treatment of mental illness was far from common in the 1930s. The life of Robert Johnson is shrouded in mystery and myths, so much so that when a possible photograph of him was found in 2015, blues fans clamoured in excitement. If it really were a photo of Johnson, it would make it one of only three in known existence. Unfortunately, it's unlikely to be the man of legend according to forensic experts, and so we are stuck with the two that we already have. His nomadic way of life only increases his mysteriousness, and it is said that the devil himself tuned his guitar to excellence in exchange for Johnson's soul at a crossroad in Mississippi. During one stop of his seemingly never-ending tour, Johnson is said to have made advances towards the wife of the owner of the roadhouse he was performing in. After drinking from an open bottle of whiskey offered to him, he was poisoned for his trouble. And so, in August of 1938, Robert Johnson died at the age of 27. He was buried in an unmarked grave. It was over 30 years before another musician joined the unfortunate irreverent company of Robert Johnson. In May of 1967, Brian Jones of the Rolling Stones was arrested after being found in possession of marijuana and for allowing his friends to smoke in his London apartment. Shortly after his arrest, Jones had a mental breakdown and sought out a psychiatrist. Dr Leonard Henry treated him for the breakdown and would later say in court that if Jones were to face jail time for the incident, that, quote, he would go into a psychotic depression as he could not possibly stand the stigma of a prison sentence and he might well attempt to injure himself. After an original sentence of nine months imprisonment, Jones appealed and the sentence was reduced to a fine. Whilst the jail time never came, it's quite possible that Jones' mental well-being was still significantly impacted by the ordeal. The whole affair from arrest to appeal took over a year to resolve and delayed the release of their satanic majesty's request. 
According to Andrew Lou Goldham, manager for the Stones during this period, Jones often felt alienated from the rest of the band. During tours, he travelled and slept separately from the rest of the group and demanded extra pay. He rejected the notion of codependence that was required of a band, and in Oldham's own words, none of them were looking forward to, quote, Brian totally cracking up. Many have suggested that there were two sides to the guitarist. As Bill Wyman, bass guitarist for the Stones, put it in his book Stoned Alone, quote, there were at least two sides to Brian's personality. One Brian was introverted, shy, sensitive, deep thinking. The other was a preening peacock, gregarious, artistic, desperately needing assurance from his peers. He pushed every friendship to the limit and way beyond. Jones certainly sounds like a troubled man. His mental well-being impacted his contribution to the Rolling Stones, which began to dwindle in 1968. His final sessions are documented on Jean-Luc Goddard's film One Plus One, which chronicles the recording of Sympathy for the Devil. Following another drug conviction, Jones was informed by Jagger, Richards and Watts that they had found a replacement for him. His overindulgence in drugs and alcohol had rendered Jones a shadow of his former talented self. His experimentation with exotic instruments is what gave the Stones some of their early distinctive sounds. It's quite possible that the drugs and alcohol came as a coping mechanism with his deteriorating mental well-being. His wild moves, swings and battle with alienation can be characteristic of numerous mental illnesses, including the likes of bipolar disorder and various personality disorders. Again, I'm not going to pretend to be a therapist here, but the links with mental health are hard to ignore. After smoking a joint and having a few drinks one day, Jones dove into a swimming pool and never came up for air, dying at the age of 27. The whole affair is shrouded in mystery, with many theorising that Jones was murdered. Keith Richards commented on the death, saying that, quote, And still, the mystery of his death hasn't been solved. I don't know what happened, but there was some nasty business going on. While the death of Brian Jones remains one of Rock's great mysteries, the official verdict states that it was his coping mechanisms that killed him. In 1967, Jones had the privilege of introducing a hot new band to the US at the Monterey Pop Festival. The act performed Bob Dylan's Like a Rolling Stone and B.B. King's Rock Me Baby, amongst other hits. As the gig was winding to a close, the band gave an eight-minute rendition of Wild Thing before the guitarist and lead singer burned his fender live on stage. And so the US got their first taste of the Jimi Hendrix experience. I'll leave the majority of their tale for a much deeper dive on Hendrix and his bandmates, but I will briefly talk about his mental health. Again, this was the 1960s, and the lines blur between mental illness and a drug addled mind. That's not to say the two are mutually exclusive. Peter Green's own schizophrenia was drug-induced, as we discussed in the first part of the Fleetwood Mac story. Addiction can often come with or cause mental illness. But as Mick Jagger put it when he was talking about Brian Jones' own addiction, quote, Things like LSD were all new. No one knew the harm. People thought cocaine was good for you. Going back to Hendrix, there have been numerous debates on his mental health, with many citing his track Manic Depression as their central basis. This side of the mental health debate alongside the 27 Club actually comes from someone who knows what they're talking about. The stuff I'm going to be talking about here comes from a psychology essay published online titled Jimi Hendrix Bipolar Disorder. It's short but worth a read and will be in the episode notes. The essay states that while there is no official evidence in terms of diagnosis, much of what Hendrix describes in his lyric match the symptoms of certain mental health disorders. The essay takes the track Manic Depression as the source of most of his evidence. The song itself is said to have been born out of a press reception during which Hendrix's manager Chas Chandler referred to the guitarist as Manic Depressive. It appears that Hendrix ran with the idea and formulated a whole song around it. One of the points the essay makes is that the lyric mentions a number of passing moods. At first, Hendrix feels sweet. In the next verse, he is clearly frustrated, and by the end of the whole affair, there's a sense of hopelessness. All this in three verses could signify pretty quick mood swings. This links in nicely with the definition of manic depression that's quoted. The ultimate conclusion the essay reaches is that it's hard to tell whether swings like this would be due to a possible mental illness or Hendrix's own drug intake. Various tales from the life of Hendrix show us that he wasn't a stranger to wild mood swings. There are various reports of domestic abuse from Hendrix to his girlfriend, Kathy Etchingham. However, Etchingham herself has spoken out against these stories, saying that they are false. After a party whilst on tour in Sweden, Hendrix went off the rails, smashing the window of his hotel room and completely trashing the place. The night receptionist of the hotel let himself into the room and discovered Hendrix alone in the pool of his own blood. After a short hospital stay, he was charged with criminal damage and had to pay a fine. I'm not trying to suggest here that those with mental health issues are inherently violent, but this is possible evidence of the manic depressive mood swings the essay discussed. But again the lines blur between mental illness and drug intake. Hendrix had no doubt been on any number of substances during the party, so who's really to say whether it's the drugs or the possible untreated mental illness that causes mood swings? 
There are many, many places online that claim that Hendrix suffered from bipolar disorder, but the truth is that we really don't know. It's certainly a possibility, however. Hendrix was known for his reckless drug intake, with his friend Deering Howe saying that, quote, Jimmy would take a handful of anything, not even knowing what it was. And ultimately, it was this that killed him. At 7am on September 18th, 1970, Hendrix just couldn't fall asleep. He took a handful of sleeping pills at 18 times the recommended dosage and died in his sleep at the age of 27. The lines are still blurred between mental illness and drug intake, with insomnia being a byproduct of both manic depression and cocaine. A whole book has been written about the mental health of the next two people we're going to be talking about. The text was written by Dr. Gerald Farris, former professor of psychology at Yale University, and Dr. Ralph Farris, a professor of sociology. So this time there is a wealth of experience behind the research. The book's full title is Living in the Dead Zone, Janis Joplin and Jim Morrison, Understanding Borderline Personality Disorder. In the book, the doctors Farris theorised that both Joplin and Morrison suffered from Borderline Personality Disorder, or BPD. According to the NHS, the main symptoms of BPD are emotional instability, disturbed patterns of thinking or perception, impulsive behaviour, and intense but unstable relationships with others. Over the course of its 250 pages, Living in the Dead Zone applies each of these symptoms to the lives of Morrison and Joplin. Joplin herself rose to fame following an appearance at the same Monterey Pop Festival that kicked off the summer of love with the burning of Jimi Hendrix's guitar. During her brief four-year career, Joplin made a significant contribution to the world of music. She was an electric stage presence and blurred the lines of sexuality in perfect summer love fashion. When rumours began spreading about her relationships with both men and women, Joplin said that, quote, I heard a rumour that somebody in San Francisco is spreading stories that I'm a dyke. You go back there and find out who it is and tell them that Janice says she's gone on with a couple of thousand cats in her life and a few hundred chicks and see what they do with that. It was pretty obvious that she didn't care for what other people thought of her sexuality. She even met Morrison once, and the two were instantly attracted to each other. Unfortunately, he was also a pretty obnoxious drunk, attempting to grab Joplin by the hair when his drunken advances proved ineffective. Not one to be underdone, Joplin hit Morrison over the head with a bottle of Southern Comfort and knocked him out cold. As with almost every member of the 27 Club that we've discussed so far, Joplin took drugs frequently. It would also be the cause of her death. In late 1970, Joplin made her final recording of A Woman Left Lonely and made her way back to her hotel. At around 1am, she injected herself with enough heroin to induce an accidental overdose. And so, just two weeks after the death of Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin died at the age of 27. Jim Morrison would follow her just nine months later. He was found dead at the age of 27 in the bathtub of his Paris apartment after a heart failure exactly two years after the death of Brian Jones. French law does not require an autopsy, but it's hard to believe that his heart failure had nothing to do with his own drug intake. Of all the members we've discussed so far, Joplin and Morrison are the ones who seem to have the most evidence of mental illness. This is largely because of the theories of the Farris doctors who seem so steeped in the psychological world that their conclusions are hard to ignore. And their conclusion was that both Joplin and Morrison suffered from BPD. Alongside BPD comes a higher risk of substance abuse. Again, we have artists who blur the lines between drug intake and mental illness as members of the 27 Club. The next artist I want to talk about is the only one that we have pretty solid evidence for their mental illness. This artist is Kurt Cobain. Before I discuss Cobain, I want to be clear that I'm not going to discuss any of the conspiracy theories surrounding his death. To do so spits on his memory. There are plenty of films and articles out there about Cobain's suicide that attempt to frame those close to him as somehow to blame for his death. Kurt Cobain was a man who suffered from mental illness, and that is what killed him. If there's any confusion here, I recommend you watch Montage of Heck, the only documentary on Cobain made with any input from his actual family. One such family member is the reason we can safely say that Cobain had a diagnosis. His cousin, Beth Cobain, gave an interview that has been documented in part by Popola Lives, a website that aims to raise awareness for those who suffer with the disorder. She's also a registered nurse with a background in mental health, so it's safe to say she knows what she's talking about. During the interview, she gave an outright statement that Kurt Cobain was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. In the article on the website, they also draw attention to the complications of substance abuse with regards to Cobain's mental well-being. He was addicted to heroin for a time before coming off of it after learning that his wife Courtney Love was pregnant. There's also a wealth of evidence for his mental struggles within the music of Nirvana. Tracks like I Hate Myself and I Want to Die are pretty blatant in their message and themes. And so, in 1994, Cobain silenced his mental torment and took his own life at the age of 27. 
It's Cobain's passing more than any other that shows the glorification of death that the cult-like worship of the 27 Club receives from some people. And with the perspective we've been looking at the 27 Club under, that becomes the glorification of mental illness. He is often painted as a tortured genius, but the truth of the matter is that Kurt Cobain had an illness. This is a group of people that have become idolised because their possible self-medication killed them. In the case of Kurt Cobain, it was the mental illness outright that did it. One of the most pervasive musical myths of our time is grounded in the cliché of the troubled artist. The idea that creativity requires torment breeds a misunderstanding of mental illness. After the death of Amy Winehouse at the age of 27 in 2011, it was made apparent that several doctors believed that she was suffering from BPD. She was never formally diagnosed because she actively avoided it. Perhaps if our cultural climate were more supportive of the mentally ill and didn't glorify the struggling artist, she may have sought help. This was the first time we tackled the area of mental health in music here at Album Art. I want to make it an ongoing series that will be updated every few months via a topic episode, taking a different angle each time. The purpose is to open the debate on mental health in a way that gets us thinking about the music we already know and love. I hope you look forward to the X century. Until next time. Album Art is written, recorded and produced by Jack Massey, with music from Sean Davies. Want to get in touch with us with a question, interpretation or artist suggestion? Tweet us at Album Art Radio or email us at artofthealbum at gmail.com. You can also find us through our website at albumart.live. Thanks for listening. <laughs>